You're traveling through the fog, and just ahead is an island. An island of mermaids, miracles, and monsters. Your next stop, Newfoundland. And these are its strange truths and tall tales. When nights grow long and familiar paths suddenly lead you astray, when fog shrouds the coast in deathly gloom and strange lights flicker in empty bogs, that's the time when ghosts and ghouls explore this newfound land. Welcome, foolish listener, to a Halloween bonus episode of the Strange Truths and Tall Tales podcast. I'm Robert your host for a brief journey into a creepy chapter of Newfoundland's past. Tonight, I'm bringing you two spooky Newfoundland tales, both about people who couldn't or wouldn't stay dead. The first is based on a nearly 200-year-old story about a sea captain, a widow, and a strangely unsettled corpse. I can't decide if it makes my blood run cold or warms my heart. I call it the restless corpse of La Poile. The skipper was an old man. He'd been sailing from Fortune Bay to the fishing grounds north of Cape St. George for longer than he could remember. His little ship had a small crew, just three men, the skipper and his two grown sons. Together they spent the summers fishing cod. It was exhausting work. They started well before dawn and continued past sunset. If they hoped to eat in the depths of winter, they had to forego sleep in the summer. Some years the fish were scarce, but this year had been a good one. The boat was full of cod, and the men were on their way home, back to Fortune Bay, much sooner than usual. The skipper guided the boat around Cape Ray and past the treacherous rocks of Isle of Mort. It had been fine sailing, but in the late evening sun he could see a fog bank dead ahead. Before dark, they were socked in. A thick mist shrouded the coastline, hiding the shoals and sunkers. The conditions were getting dangerous. To make matters worse, a low grumble of thunder was rolling across the water. Faster than seemed possible, the storm surrounded them. It was as if it had risen from right under the boat. The ocean swelled, tossing them violently. The heavy cargo meant the vessel was riding low in the water, The sea swept across the deck, washing from port to starboard as lightning streaked all around them. Thunder seemed to knock at the ship's timbers, as if it were trying to rip the boat apart. Never in all his years at sea had the skipper seen a storm so fierce, and never had he been so frightened. If he hoped to survive, if he hoped to save his boys, he had to find a safe harbor, somewhere to weather out the storm. It was a dangerous prospect. Too many sailors had died misjudging the coastline of southwestern Newfoundland. The hope of finding a port through the darkness and fog was slim, and navigating to it through the storm would be a long shot. It was grim. Then, in a flash of lightning, he caught sight of it, the coastline. There was a break in the fog. It was as if someone opened a door and through it he could see the entrance to Lapoile Bay. It was unmistakable. He'd seen it a thousand times before. The shelter of Lopoil Bay was their best bet for making it through the storm. The fog closed in again and the door swung shut, but he'd seen all he needed to. The skipper pulled hard on the wheel. It was almost funny. All his life he'd fought to stay off the rocky coast, but now, in a storm and blinding fog, he was trying to stay alive by steering right toward it. It was insanity. He prayed the embrace of Lapoil Bay was just ahead, but it was too foggy to be certain of anything. Then there was another flash of lightning. There was nothing ahead but rock. The skipper was sure he'd seen the entrance to the bay. He swung the wheel furiously. He had to find it, or they'd all be dead. Again the lightning flashed, but still no sign of the bay. The thunder continued its relentless pounding. Blindly, the skipper guided the vessel onward, willing the ship to find the bay. If he wasn't on course now, he was running out of time to correct. There would be no time to turn away from the rocks. They'd be as good as dead. Suddenly, 
the ocean calm. In the lightning, the skipper could make out the steep shores of Lapoil Bay rising out of the sea around them. The third time was the charm. As if guided by an unseen hand, the ship found shelter. The skipper eased the boat forward. The further into the bay he went, the calmer the sea became. The fog began to clear, and the sound of the storm faded away. The skipper happened upon an old wharf. He hadn't been looking for a place to tie up, but given the opportunity, he seized it. The ship seemed to drift effortlessly toward the wharf. The men were exhausted. The skipper's sons soon found their bunks and fell into a deep sleep. Despite his exhaustion, the skipper couldn't rest. He returned to the deck. In all the trips he'd taken, never had he felt such danger. He'd been certain he was about to captain his boys to their death. He couldn't bear closing his eyes. The image of the ship on the rocks and the bodies of his sons being pulled beneath the waves played out before him. It made him sick. He sighed and gazed ashore. A short distance from the wharf, the skipper spotted a light. It was awfully late, he thought, for someone to be awake, let alone have a lamp lit. Perhaps something was wrong. Perhaps someone needed help. Through the darkness, he made his way down a narrow path. As he got closer, he could see the light was, indeed, a lamp. It was illuminating the window of a small, roughly constructed house. It seemed to be the only home for some distance. He walked toward it. As he reached the door, he paused. What was he doing? It was awfully late to disturb the people inside, even if they did still have a lamp burning. Before he'd made up his mind, he felt his knuckles on the door. His knocking sounded more urgent, more forceful than he would ever have wanted. In the name of God, whoever you are, come in and mock me no longer, came an exasperated voice from inside. Slowly, the skipper opened the door. Inside, in the far corner of the kitchen, was an old woman. He'd never seen anyone look more distraught. Her face was pale and drawn. Her cheeks were wet with tears. Upon seeing the skipper, she left her chair and walked toward him. Tentatively, she took his hand and squeezed it. You are an angel, she whispered. Before the skipper could respond, the woman began to speak. Only a month ago, my boys went to sea. They had to go, I know, but they left us here. We used to fish together, but me and John are too old for it now. And, and yesterday, she continued, John took sick. We've been married nearly sixty years, and I've never known him to be ill. I tried to nurse him, but nothing worked. I wanted to go for help, but I couldn't leave. The, the nearest house is miles away. I couldn't leave him. All through the night I stayed beside him. I could see he was dying, she sobbed. I didn't want him to be alone. Then, tonight, a storm came up, she said. It was an awful storm, the worst storm I can remember. With each peal of thunder, John writhed. He, he swore he wouldn't leave me, but I knew his time was short. In his feverish state, he seemed to think of our boys. Again and again he called out, telling them to mind the rocks, to find their way, to come back to us. It was the last thing he said, the widow sobbed. She turned away from the skipper as if to compose herself. Though I knew he was going to die, I could hardly credit it. It didn't seem as if it could be true. Just two days ago, we were so happy. I don't know how I will get through this alone. She shook her head and continued. I hadn't collected my thoughts before there was a noise. It sounded like a knock at the door. I rushed across the room to open it. I was sure God had sent someone, some kind soul to help me in my despair. I threw the door open, but there was no one. I tried to convince myself that I'd imagined the knocking. I closed the door and returned to John. She gestured toward the opposite corner of the room. But things weren't as I left them. I don't understand it, she paused. But when I got back, John was looking at me. He was dead as ever, but he propped himself up on his elbow and seemed to be gazing toward the door. It was as if he was trying to see outside. The widow shook her head. I sat beside him and guided his head back to the pillow. I listened for a heartbeat. I felt for breath, but there was nothing. After a few minutes, I convinced myself that my grief was deceiving me, that I was losing my mind. 
I said a quick prayer and set about dressing his body. I had barely started when there was another knock, louder and more urgent than before. I knew I hadn't imagined it, so I ran to the door. I was sure that this time there would be someone here to help me, but again there was nothing. Somehow I felt so much more alone than before. Imagine my shock, the widow's eyes widened, when I saw John. He was sitting bolt upright. Again, he was looking toward the door. I felt sure he must be alive, or maybe was alive again. I fancied that perhaps the knocking was that of his soul returning. I rushed to him. I called his name. I touched his cheek. But his flesh was colder than before, and I sat there on the bed, she confided, and wept as I never have in my life. I saw myself for what I was, a foolish old widow. I took a deep breath and decided to face the truth. John was dead, and I needed to ready him for burial. I barely sat about it when again there came a knock. She shook her head. I knew to expect nothing outside. Still, I played my part in the charade. I went to the door, opened it, found nothing, and slammed it shut. When I went back to John, the bed was empty. He was standing beside it, as if frozen, mid-step. His corpse was reaching out, pointing toward the door. His teeth were bared, and there was a look of such determination on his face. I felt sick, as if God were mocking me. I pushed his corpse back down on the bed. I'd no sooner done it than the terrible knocking came again. She looked at the skipper. And that was you. The widow wrapped her arms around the skipper and began to cry. After a long moment, she guided him to the far corner of the room. There lay the body of her husband, just as she'd left him, disheveled, but finally at rest. Together, they prepared the body for burial. Afterward, the widow made a pot of tea. They sat at the kitchen table, and she spoke, not of the strange events of the evening, but of her life and many memories with John and her boys. She was, the skipper thought, hardly recognizable as the woman he'd encountered an hour earlier. The old skipper knew the superstitions of the Newfoundland coast as well as anyone. He'd heard his fair share of ghost stories, too, but this was the first time he'd lived one. He scarcely knew what to make of his experience. It defied explanation. He couldn't explain how he'd safely made it to the widow's door. He felt an unseen hand must have guided his ship to Lopoyle Bay that night. Had it been the widow's husband? Had he, from somewhere between this world and the next, ushered the boat to shore? Had the widow's husband saved the lives of his sons? And what about what the widow saw? Maybe the restless corpse had been pulled like a puppet on a string by a spirit desperately reaching out, reaching out to pull the boat into the bay. He felt sure he owed the dead man a debt. In the years that followed, the skipper thought often about the widow and the time they spent around her kitchen table. He remembered the comfort she seemed to find sharing the memories of her family life. Maybe, the skipper thought, the widow's dead husband had done more than save his ship that night. Maybe he'd been performing one last act of kindness for his wife, too. If a debt was ever owed, perhaps it had been paid in full over a cup of tea in a tiny kitchen in La Poyle. That was my retelling of The Widow of La Poyle, a Newfoundland tale. It came from an 1831 edition of the newspaper Public Ledger. The original author was credited only as R. While the writer indicates that the story was relayed to them by the skipper in the tale, I imagine it was wholly the creation of the writer. If the story existed as a folk tale prior to its appearance in the Public Ledger, I don't know anything about it. But if you do, I'd love to hear it. The comments are always open. Now, on to our next story. This one comes from Old St. John's, and it's about a woman who spent her life with the dead, and, if the rumors are true, her death with the living. Here's the story I call Mrs. Coyle and the Corpse. 
Nancy Coyle could raise the dead, and everyone in St. John's knew it. It all started about 200 years ago, when Mrs. Coyle lived atop Carter's Hill. St. John's was a very different place then. It was a time when the port was full of tall-masted ships, and the waterfront was crowded with sailors from countries all along the Atlantic. Through the night, songs in unfamiliar languages carried from the harbor to the houses of the city. It was exciting, and for most citizens, a good time was certainly easy enough to find. Not so for Nancy Coyle. Nancy was an elderly widow, managing a household all by herself. She was willing to work, but for a woman of her age, a paying job was hard to find. Still, Nancy did what she could. Late into the evening, she kept a light burning in an upstairs window, welcoming weary travelers. Though many stayed, the money she earned was never enough to make ends meet. She needed a good job, and Nancy, being wise, realized the easiest job to get was a job no one else wanted. Though St. John's was a cosmopolitan port with visitors from all over the world, it lacked some of the amenities of other cities. One such service was a city morgue. Most citizens didn't care whether St. John's had a morgue or not. At the time, it was customary for families to take care of their own dead. They laid them out, waked, and buried them without the need of any mortuary services. For ships in port, it was a different story. When one of the sailors died, as was bound to happen from time to time, there was no one in St. John's to care for the body. Nancy saw an opportunity. She agreed, in exchange for a stipend from the government, to take the city's deceased sailors, strangers, and anyone else in need of mortuary care into her home, where she would prepare them for burial. It was an honest job, but one that came at a cost. When Nancy's neighbors learned that she was spending her days in the company of corpses, they didn't like it. It wasn't long before Nancy's circle of friends dwindled. Then things got worse. One night, a Dutch sailor was out on the town. He was drinking, socializing with the people of the port, and having a good time. At the end of the evening, he began his solitary trek back to his ship. He hurried down the pier. His speed, combined with an evening of drinking, led to disaster. He slipped, hit his head, and tumbled into the harbor. No one knows how long the young sailor's body drifted between the ships, but when he was found, he was floating on his back. His unblinking eyes were staring at the stars. They knew it was too late to help. The crew hooked his body with a grapnel and dragged it ashore. A short while later, the young sailor's corpse was delivered to Nancy's door. All alone, she went about her work. She washed his cold, pale body and wrapped him in a sheet. Just as she finished, just as she had him ready to be nailed into a coffin, the corpse coughed. The young man sat up and surveyed his surroundings. You can imagine Nancy's shock. Her corpse was no corpse at all. The man who had retrieved the body had been too hasty. The young sailor hadn't been killed by his fall into the harbor. He had been rendered unconscious. In the comfort of Nancy's parlor, he'd awakened. Realizing immediately what had happened, Nancy got her dead sailor a drink. When he'd recovered sufficiently, she guided him back to his boat on the waterfront. The sailors couldn't believe what they were seeing. Their dead shipmate was once again alive. It wasn't long before stories of Nancy and the sailor were being told all through the city. Few wanted to discuss how she saved a man's life. Instead, they whispered that she must have some kind of dark, supernatural power, that she could resurrect the dead. People turned on Nancy. They already found her work with corpses distasteful, but the thought that she could raise the dead was downright scary. They wanted nothing to do with her, in life or in death. It is said that a few years later, when Nancy died, no one would care for her body. They were afraid to work with the corpse of a woman who could control life and death. To this day, no one knows what happened to her. It doesn't seem like a very fitting legacy for a woman who chose to bring dignity to the dead. Nancy Coyle died nearly 200 years ago. 
but people still talk of her to this day, and they do so with a shiver. Nancy, some believe, still keeps a vigil over the dead of St. John's. She can be found from time to time in the city's cemeteries. She wears a bright red cloak as she wanders between the graves. Sometimes she is seen alone, other times she trails behind a phantom hearse. If the rumors are true, Nancy Coyle is spending her death much as she spent her life, ushering the dead to the great beyond. When it comes to Nancy Coyle, it's tough to say exactly where the strange truth ends and the tall tale begins. It seems likely there was a historical Nancy Coyle who provided mortuary care in her home in St. John's circa 1840. Paul O'Neill writes of her in his book, The Oldest City, The Story of St. John's, and Heritage NL has a web page dedicated to her. O'Neill relates the tale of her revival of the Dutch sailor and suggests that this was not an isolated incident that Nancy witnessed more than one corpse come back from the dead. I tried to find Nancy in old colonial records, and to some degree I succeeded. The government did indeed pay money to a Nancy coil, but the only records of payment I found were monies paid by the colonial government for the support of the aged. This is not to say that she wasn't paid for providing mortuary care. I just didn't find any record documenting it. My search, however, was far from exhaustive. I'm pretty sure the truth of Nancy Coyle stops somewhere before her supposed hauntings begin. The book Haunted Canada 5, Terrifying True Tales by Joel A. Sutherland relates the tale of Nancy, including her haunting of downtown St. John's. He called his, his story Queen of the Dead. Sutherland writes that Nancy witnessed the revival of a man named John Murphy, who'd spent many years in an asylum. I'm not sure where Sutherland sourced this tale or whether he created it himself. If you know more about Nancy Coyle and John Murphy, well, I'll say what I always say at one of these stories. I'd love to hear about it, and the comments are open. Thanks for listening. This is the end of my 2024 Halloween series. It's been a lot of fun getting these stories ready. I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope you found them a little spooky, too. If you're not ready to give up on the spookiness yet, you can check out the blog, productofnewfoundland.ca. I have a ton of creepy and not-so-creepy tales over there. Just this week I shared stories about a headless ghost in Bannerman Park and the story of a series of mysterious fires in Flat Rock. I've also curated a list of some of my favorite spooky music by Newfoundland and Labrador's artists. It covers a range of themes and definitely helps to set the end of October mood. It's got ghosts, demons, murderers, devils, dead bodies, hell, Shakespearean witch quotes, gothic novel references, howling wolves, and slasher flick killers. And that's just the beginning, really. I'll drop a link in the episode's descriptions. Stay tuned for Season 3 of Strange Truths and Tall Tales. It's coming up right on the heels of Halloween. And thank you for listening. Have a great and spooky Halloween. <laughs>